Okay. Well, it's my distinct honor to, to welcome Professor King, uh, Kim Prather to SOMAS uh, for this seminar. Kim is a distinguished professor from the UCSD chemistry department and from Scripps. I've known Kim for, I can only approximate, but it's about 25 years as a colleague in the atmospheric chemistry field. While Kim started out as a sort of instrument developer slash builder extraordinaire, she's become way more than that. And her con contributions to what I call earth science and to earth system science and ocean atmosphere interactions are, are extensive and uh, high impact. She has uh, been focusing most of her career on interactions between human activities and the oceans, aerosols, and cloud covering climate, and is going to speak about that, uh, those things today. Kim is also uh, an authority on uh, <coughs> airborne viruses and on the airborne transmission of COVID. And the, and the role of uh, aerosols rather than droplets in the transmission. And in fact, she published a letter in Science in today's print version on this subject. So you can go to, if you just uh, Google Kim Prather in, in Science and COVID, I think it comes right up. Um, so, so <coughs> excuse me. Among Kim's many honors and distinctions is that she is one of the very few people I know who is both a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences. I know Kim as uh, a creative scientist and, and Kim knows that I know this, a great speaker. Uh, mm -hmm. But now, now I'm taking up her time <laughs> so uh, I don't want to do that. Her talk is entitled, How do Biological Processes in the Ocean Change Cloud Properties and Climate and Marine Environments? So uh, take it away, Kim, and uh, say whatever you want. Oh, that's dangerous. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Paul. Um, yeah, and I can tell Paul stories for like the next 45 minutes and probably make some money, but I won't. No! <laughs> <laughs> I get the I get to say after you go, so you have to be careful. Anyway, well, I'm really honored to to be able to uh, to speak uh, on some of the research we've been doing. I decided to sort of step back, as as um, Paul mentioned. I have my life for the last eight months has been, uh, yeah, focused on airborne viruses. And there's yeah, the letter I didn't realize it came out today in print. That paper that letter was accepted like in 24 hours. That was crazy. Um, those are the hardest 300 words I've ever written. I also published another paper, if you're curious, back in May, sort of conjecturing on why, on how this virus was so um, stealthily making it around our planet and shutting us down and what we could do about it. So, um, and most of the, most of the like, sort of, it was just the connecting the dots. It's in the air, it's aerosols. At that time, it was kind of early in the game. Most of it, is still still standing. So if you're curious, that's my other life. I, I just gave a seminar two days ago at MIT on that topic. Um, but today I get to talk about CASE. So what is CASE? Well, K oops, sorry, aerosols, hold on. Yeah, okay. So CASE is a Center for Chemical Innovation. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, and it's the Centers for Chemical Innovation, I can't, I've kind of lost track how many there are right now. I think we got down to like eight at one point um, in the United States, but they're, they're centers that focus on a problem where chemistry is limiting, our lack of understanding of the chemical processes that are happening is limiting our ability to address that problem or solve that problem, I should say. So in 2009, uh, we proposed, so we've been doing this now for a decade, uh, but we proposed sort of the concept of aerosols and surfaces and interfaces um, you know, sort of stretching out sort of the concept of, you know, we knew surfaces were important in the stratosphere, but they must be important in the troposphere. But the challenge being that 
the ones in the troposphere are so much more chemically complex and how do we ever address how they're behaving in the real world. And so this is a center, um, I'd be remiss to, to, you know, to not mention thanking all the people that have been involved. Um, it's, you know, it's a huge, it's become bigger and bigger, but there's about 12 institutions that are formally involved. Um, and there's a lot of other collaborations that go on, especially when we do some large scale studies that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this is a picture from our last annual meeting at Scripps, Scripps Peers in the background with our advisors. Um, but it's, it's an amazing, amazing team effort that goes, that spans all the way from the real ocean and atmosphere to very, very fundamental studies on the surfaces of particles. And I will touch more on the extreme that I'm involved with, the, the more complex ocean atmosphere exchange. Um, but yeah, there's sort of a, a wide range of studies that we are doing in case um, that, as I say, involves the beauty of a center, I should say, is that it's chemistry, but we've got oceanographers that sort of helped us do it right. We have marine biologists, microbiologists that helped us do it right. And I will talk about what I mean by that as I step through sort of the grand overview of what CASE is. All right. So I don't think I have to, for this audience, talk too much about what's an atmospheric aerosol. I just want to make the point that, you know, basically we're all connected. Um, you know, we, had, we did research ooh, and we published 2013, I think, in science showing that, you know, dust, African dust can go all the way across the Pacific and change the snowfall in California. So aerosols can have profound impacts on uh, both global and I've focused more on the regional climate, the precipitation side. That's been a, that was a big focus of mine. Um, Paul mentioned that I developed instruments. The instruments look at single particles by mass spec in real time. And so we flew those instruments through clouds to try and understand which sources of aerosols influence precipitation. That was a big part of my career for a good uh, decade or more. Um, but basically, sort of, I always think of this, this movie, which I love, which shows all the different types of aerosols circling the globe. And, um, you know, basically, I, now I'm sort of as I mentioned, answering questions about can aerosols go six feet? And I always think, I always think of this, but I don't want to confuse the public, so I try not to say it too much. But basically, you know, I've become more and more interested, I'm deeply interested in sort of more the biological components. Here's my one virus um, mentioned here. Um, they're about 100 nanometers if they're naked. This virus, SARS-CoV-2, is not, about a micron more. Um, bacteria, but basically they span a range from you know 10 nanometers up to about 10 microns is as big as we talk about we have a very major focus in case on natural aerosols so particular in particular sea spray but our mission statement at the beginning was i've done 20 years of field studies and we've gone out and you go out for two three weeks and you measure what you can you measure whatever sort of nature and humans deliver at the time you make the best story you can but as a chemist Oftentimes, you don't come away that fully satisfied that you really explained, you learn, you know, that you understood what happened at a level where you could like actually predict, you know, predict how to sort of fix it or change it or make it better, right? And so you sort of empirically, you try to go back to the lab. We try to go back to the lab. We try and replicate what we think mattered and then reproduce the results and sort of work back and forth between lab and field studies. But there is a disconnect between those. And part of that is because it's really hard to develop sort of um, model systems from a chemical perspective in the lab for the troposphere. They, said they did it for the stratosphere. Um, my colleague, um, former colleague, uh, Mario Molina did that. Uh, and you know, on the stratosphere, there was far fewer chemical components and so they could do lab studies. But in the troposphere, this is a much more complicated problem. So we said to NSF, we're gonna move the ocean atmosphere into the lab and we're gonna be able to sort of change things, perturb things one at a time and really go after sort of how chemistry matters. So the way we did this, this is all the steps and the big overarching question we're trying to now address is what is controlling the composition of the marine atmosphere? What is controlling the composition from a climate perspective, what's controlling the composition of things that actually seed the clouds, right? So the center of every cloud droplet is an aerosol, center of every ice crystal is an aerosol, which ones are they, you know, and how do changes in the ocean actually influence these clouds, which people have been seeing for, you know, several decades now. So first thing we did was we started learn. we learned, well, actually the second thing, but I'll start with sort of the basics of the biology. We're with Farouk Azam, who's a pioneer 
He's the one that sort of discovered or pointed out what's called the microbial loop. Many people who've looked at the influence of the ocean just do a phytoplankton bloom and they're done. They take that phytoplankton, make massive quantities, dump it in salt and say, that's the ocean. But that's not the ocean. Basically, once you induce a phytoplankton bloom by adding nutrients, you make uh, bacteria, bac heterotrophic bacteria say, ooh, carbon, that's their food. They grow and then viruses grow. And so you get this cycle. And this is what leads to, they estimate up to 10 to the 15 different organic compounds in the ocean, which we would never be able to repl replicate correctly in the lab, you know, looking them up in an Aldridge catalog and dumping them in in the proper pr proportion. So in a, in a sense, these are our organic chemists, right? They are really good at synthesizing the sort of plethora of all these different organic compounds. So we get the microbial loop going. Oceanographers came to us and they said, you atmospheric chemists are doing it all wrong. You're sticking fritz in water, single bubble sizes. And in that case, you sort of transfer everything to the air so that ocean air, air transfer is wrong. And, um, you know, we'd been doing it, you know, everyone was kind of doing it by, it's really easy to make sea spray. But when you're trying to transfer the right chemical compounds, you know, basically, especially there, it's a super sensitive surface process. And so bubbles, just depending on the size of the bubble, you will scavenge different compounds. And so you have to get the right, what we call bubble size distribution. And I'll come back to that in a minute. That gets, all that work goes into just giving us our starting material in chemistry terms. We have sea spray that looks just like the stuff out over the ocean. So now we can start thinking about how they react. We can do oxidation reactions, photochemistry reactions. And this is what I'm gonna talk a lot about today is what happens you know, to primary or nascent sea spray after it's emitted from the ocean, which has been a big focus for the last few years in case. So once, you know, we spent a huge amount of case, the first eight years looking at just generating it correctly, looking at the properties of sea spray, looking at how complex just sea spray is at the single particle level. But as I'll describe, it became really important to sort of add in these extra reactions that happen when these particles hit the air because it will actually change the surface properties, which will affect their ability to make cloud droplets and to make ice crystals. And so, you know, basically doing these reactions is really important. This is where the picture started for us. This is what people thought was a good model system was sort of a salt mixed with a surfactant and a nice layer coating that could actually turn off reactions. That is not representative really of what happens in the real world. We actually, I'll come back to sort of finishing up with what I wanted to say real quickly. Just the other thing we've added in, sorry, is that we didn't have in our original proposal, so in the interest of full disclosure, is how important the gases are. And that's what you're gonna hear about today. And Paul will be shocked to hear me talking about this. Um, because I, you know, I like, why are all these people? Why did Paul spend all this time measuring these gases? Well, I'm a believer now. And so you'll see why. So big discovery was sort of these reactive VOCs that come out of the ocean. We believe these are playing you know, a dominant role in controlling the composition of the marine atmosphere now. Um, we also see enzymes coming out of the ocean. And for those of you who care about uh, the sea surface microlayer, they're enriched like crazy in the sea surface microlayer. These enzymes act at interfaces, both at the surface of the ocean as well as the surface of particles. They become actually incredibly active, and this is leading to a lot of the transformations that we see. So the last thing I'll just sort of throw out there is that we now have full-blown modeling. This was used for SARS-CoV-2. It was the centerfold in the New York Times this weekend, I think. Um, this is Romeo Morrow's work. This is one particle that's mixed with lipids and enzymes and water and salts. And you can see that it doesn't look anything like the model system, but it actually explains a lot of our observations. And so we're doing high level computable, Romy's group is doing high level computational simulations of what happens at the interfaces and inside of these particles. It's a really interesting part of case that I won't get to talk about, but I just wanted to mention. So what does it take to transfer the ocean atmosphere to, into the lab? I think everybody here knows the ocean is not just salt. Um, you know, Steve Schwartz has, you know, I think we've, we've pushed him to change the title. We're gonna get him to change the title yet. Sea salt to sea spray. I think he's a believer now, but it's a lot more complicated. You know, the ocean is a living ocean. You know, it's got lots of life and that life doesn't really want to be in the ocean, right? So it sits very enriched in the sea surface microlayer. There's viruses, bacteria, you know, sort of everything that you can imagine. The shocking thing to me is that so few people have sort of 
paid attention to this, I would say, in the sense of like how that affects the transfer of what gets in the air, especially the VOCs. Far more work has been done on terrestrial sources, either soil or forests, even though the oceans cover, you know, a huge, almost three quarters of our earth, a lot of gases come out of that ocean. It's like a forest underwater. So this just shows a, a image that just make noise. Anyway, sorry. Ah. Anyway, this is, I don't know how to shut that up. Uh, sorry. This just shows the wave channel that we use. It's got lights. You can actually see that, um, you know, this is a, during an experiment we did last summer called Seascape that I'll talk about. But this was where nearly 90 people came in with all their equipment, and I will describe this in more detail, but the point is, this is our ocean lab. This is real seawater, real breaking waves, and real biology. And this is what we use in case to kind of try and understand and isolate uh, this real world you know, ocean. And what I will say is one of the big surprises, to me anyway, has been, and you'll see this over and over today, is that it's, it's these reactive gases that come out that people have, I think, missed because they are so reactive that once they hit the atmosphere, they're gone. But here we have it isolated, so we can actually detect a lot of gases that people have kind of ignored or not seen over many decades. All right, so you know, in addition to this wave breaking, which is shown here, here's another shot of this channel. Um, we actually came up with smaller systems where we have a plunging waterfall that pulses on and off. We also um, created a smaller system that has a more gentle mechanism of plunging so that more of the microbes, especially like the dinoflagellates, can survive. And we can use this to actually, you know, these can be used on, they're being used on ships and other labs all over the world where, you know, you may not have access to a gigantic wave channel. So these are all things that we've created in case that people are now using to create realistic sea spray in the lab. So we've gone from sort of the sort of gold standard, you know, real thing all the way to uh, the more simple system, but they give us the same bubbles. And so why do we care about the same bubbles? This just shows a paper we published in PNAS in 2013 that shows that there's actually a broad spectrum of bubble sizes that's shown here. And a plunging waterfall maps onto what a real breaking wave in the ocean gives you. And that ends up giving you the right particle size distributions in sea spray and the right composition. You can see if you use spritz of just a narrow size distribution, you get a very sharp spike in totally different particles. They also chemically look different and they react different and they form ice differently. Everything about them changes if you don't use the right bubbles. So once you use the right bubbles, you can actually, one of the discoveries in case is we are actually were able to show that through the different mechanisms, and again, these are in Steve's book, I learned about them in Steve's book, you have this, this film drop production and jet drop production. But we were able to separate these two and look at the composition and show that the composition of particles that come out of jet drops versus film drops, I guess not surprisingly, but it hadn't been shown before, is very, very different. And so, in fact, you know, these will, they actually form, have a, we have a paper that's just about ready to come out in geophysical research letters that shows that these have very different ice nucleating properties depending on how they form. So, you know, in general, we see, you know, more surfactants, more hydrophobic stuff in the film drop produce smaller particles. And in the jet, the bigger things, we see whole cells and sugars and other things like that. So thinking about phytoplankton blooms, you know, one of the hypotheses, the Gaia hypothesis, the claw hypothesis from long ago, was that this is the way the ocean might be able to regulate the planetary health. Just like microbes regulate the health of humans, they can regulate the health of the planet. Um, potentially by what is emitted. If that, go, if that gases in the particles end, end up changing the cloud properties and making things cooler, they can actually cool things off or warm things up depending on what gets released into the atmosphere. So can we study this in the lab? This is sort of the big picture overarching question that we have. So again, numerous field, field studies have shown that in regions where you have high chlorophyll, you get much higher cloud droplet number, number concentrations. The more cloud droplet number concentrations you have, the basically the more cloud drops you have, so tinier cloud drops, so wider, brighter clouds will actually cool things off. And so, you know, the question we have had for 10 years in case that we've been trying to get at is what leads to this change? There is a pretty big controversy, you know, sort of centered around this. Some people see a change in things when there's a bloom going on, some people don't. 
you know, it's been a pretty big uh, area of debate over the years is what I will say. And so the question is, can we in a controlled way address this question? So Doug Collins, who many of you know, was a student in my group and, you know, he spent his whole thesis trying to, trying to get what's called the hygroscopicity parameter, which basically relates to how effectively a fresh sea spray particle will nucleate a cloud drop. The higher kappa is, the more salty and more readily it forms a cloud drop. The lower, it's not, it's more hydrophobic, it's kind of where the organics lie. These lines on here are, um, are values taken from field studies where they show that as chlorophyll increases in the ocean, it sort of, kappa sort of it plummets. These black dots are points that Doug took over years in his thesis. He could not get the particles to budge, the primary sea spray. He could not get them to become sort of less hygroscopic over time. And so this was, this was a conundrum that we faced um, for a while. We induced massive phytoplankton blooms to unrealistic, I should say, um, concentrations of chlorophyll to really get it dense bloom, to try and get the, the hygroscopicity to fall to more organic ease. Because we can see the particles were becoming more organic and rich. We could not get it to budge. And so this was a place, I won't say we were stuck, but uh, we spent some time getting this right. So, whoops, let me keep going. So basically, if we put this in perspective, you know, here's a hygroscopicity parameter. Uh, this is just a bloom, that, you know, some work that Doug did, where you can see that the hygroscopicity parameter is up here for all of his work. No matter what he did over the course of a bloom, you know, basically it doesn't budge, as I said. In the field, this is a compilation by Sweet Licky who shows that, you know, it's more like 0.6 or 0.7. It's kind of in this range is what people observe over the oceans. If you think about just pure organic compounds, it should be even lower. We don't see that. Even though we see that the particles contain a lot of organic species, a lot of what we think are hydrophobic organic species, we can never ever see it sort of drop down into this region. So the big question of the day, and what I'll answer by the end of this talk is, what is, you know, can we, in the lab, you know, move from here to here. Can we, can we actually explain what leads to this sort of band of measurements that are observed in the field? That's the big sort of holy grail question for CASE when we set it up, was that we want to be able to explain field measurements. And we spent a lot of time, as I say, stuck up here and we want to get down here. So, as I mentioned, we had the right breaking waves, we made primary sea spray, but this biological activity, we really shifted our focus to think about these volatile gases. These volatile gases can come out, they're highly reactive. They hit OH or any other oxidant and can rapidly form what, we, what we're gonna talk about today, which is called secondary marine aerosol. So again, thinking about what dominates the composition of the marine atmosphere, it's, you know, we see a lot more evidence that it's these secondary um, particles that form from these gases that are emitted. Now, let me just step back and say that you know, I've been a person that's focused very much on primary aerosols my whole career. It's another place where I'm shifting because a lot of people have spent time looking at SOA, you know, secondary organic aerosol. That's what kind of this is. This is just more driven, um, we call it secondary marine because it's using the mixture. A lot of work has been done on just oxidizing isoprene or beta pinene or a lot of these sort of natural VOCs. What we're trying to do in case is the real thing. So we're looking at the full mixture. And so that's what I'll be talking about. So once we make these, do we actually start to see them behave like the cloud, the kappa that we see for clouds? So this just shows again, sort of a shot of um, seascape. There was you know, a lot of people involved in this study. Um, we had an artist sort of sending out pictures of sort of our lab in the or ocean in the lab, you can see here's like the nitrogen, it's symbolic. Uh, we get a great cohort, I'll come back to this, of summer students, so people are ever interested or want to send undergrads our way, every summer, except for this last summer we had to cancel, um, we do, we involve summer undergrads. So the goal here was to actually start not just looking at primary nascent sea spray, but to sort of also look at the gases and then start to do reactions. And so we really ramped up sort of adding on the reactions that happen when things get out in, in seascape. So this just shows the different sampling lines where we sampled straight up nascent sea spray. We compared that to you know, oxidizing things and just basically oxidizing the organics and then forming the secondary marine aerosol, which I'll talk about um, today. We also had a dome where we sort of 
further isolated, I would say the gases, I'm not going to go too much into detail. I just, we had all of these different sampling lines looking at all the different ways you can sort of lead to different types of marine aerosols. So it was big. There was a lot of people involved. Um, this is the full list of people that were involved. And, um, you know, we had people sort of focusing on everything from, you know, what's in the air in terms of gases and particles um, to what's in the water in terms of metabolites genomics, um, the viruses, the bacteria, sort of the full suite of measurements um, across the spectrum. So just to show you quickly, we had aerosol measurements like crazy, all the way down to the smallest sizes that Jim Smith's group participated. So we had a TD Sims to do the teeniest ones to see what forms. We had size distribution measurements, phase measurements, fluorescence measurements. We had a lot of measurements. We also looked at sort of MDOM that forms in the ocean and the properties of that compared to typical sort of what people think about is um, CDOM. Uh, let's see, that's aerosol. I'm just gonna go through this fast. Gases. We had three different ways of measuring VOCs using different tools as well as just other um, pollutants that are present, can be present. Um, we also did Persian trap measurements of what's in the water versus what's in the air. Um, so yeah, a wide range of gas measurements. And then finally, we did a wide range of sort of biology measurements and sort of standard seawater measurements that you would measure on a ship. So what we did was we would bring the seawater in. This shows the, the conga line. We would collect the water down at the pier. We have a tap. We can just turn on and fill up our flume, but that messes up the biology. They don't really like being pumped over that range. So we're going to do one of these experiments for a few weeks. We want to get it right. So they fill up these tubs. They drive them up, they run a hose, and this is the hose putting the water in, and they do this, I think, 16 times. And then we add nutrients, and then we add lights. And what we did different in this experiment than we've ever done before was we actually cycled the lights. We had a day-night, pretty simple pattern, but it was the first time we looked at the effects of day-night cycling on the bloom. Just to show you one of the blooms, we'd actually got three blooms during Seascape, but this is just the, what we get every time. What you see is this peak in chlorophyll, which means the phytoplankton grew, and then this gets back to my point about the bacteria in red grow in later. There, you know, once they see that food source of the phytoplankton, they take off as well. So our goal is to look at how the sea spray and how the gases change over the course of the entire bloom, and you know, do we see differences when there's you know massive amounts of phytoplankton versus massive amounts of bacteria? Oops, sorry. So just to come back to the base question, you know, to make sure that we're calibrated and nothing weird is happening, we looked at the sea spray aerosol and how sort of the organic fraction changed. It changed a little bit. It went up a little bit. Here's the phytoplankton over the course of the bloom. But back to the hygroscopicity parameter, you can see here it is right around 1.2, very salty. You know, phytoplankton peak, nothing changes. To remind you, this is ambient field observations down in here. So again, just confirms no matter what we do, um, we cannot get the hygroscopicity parameter or the cloud condensation nuclei forming potential of these particles to change no matter what we do for the primary sea spray, for any of the blooms. So to the gases. These are the gas types of uh, species that were present. Um, and we know that these all emit different gases for different reasons. There's a lot of reasons why VOCs come out of the ocean. Some of it's just quorum sensing, some of it's communication, some of it's stress, sometimes they're just happy. So there's all these reasons why you get different types of um, gases that come out depending on which species you have. And we were doing counts, we were doing imaging. We had a student from um, UC Santa Barbara, Sarah Miri, this is her figure she made, actually looking at what was there. We also had a flow cam, uh, Jules Jaffe's flow cam. So we actually, I think for the first time, have images of these, it's a lot of images, continuously over the course of a bloom. So how do we look at the gases? We use chemical ionization mass spec. I think I mentioned this is measurements in my lab where we actually you know, can use different reagent ions. So we can use benzene, we can use amines, we can use protonated water clusters. Each one of those different types of reagent ions reacts with the gases and lets you look at different classes of compounds. So you kind of have to pick. And we spend a lot of time using benzene cluster cations because it lets us look at the sulfur species. So as opposed to the primary sea spray, which didn't change, this just shows really quickly how the gases 
vary a lot. And this is just looking at one reagent ion for dimethyl sulfide, monotropines, and oxygenated monotropines. So we've summed them up. And you can see over the course of the bloom, they have a lot of variability. They don't just stay flat like the primary sea spray. So this is our first hint that something um, interesting is happening to the gases over the course of the bloom. So what we did was we took these gases and we pumped them through what's called a PAM. Uh, this is just a, 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 I keep it simple, but it's just a, um, an oxidative flow tube. In this case, this one uses O8, creates OH. And that OH, you can base, I'll describe it more in the next slide, but you can use this to age. Whoops, I did a jump. You can use this to age the, gas, the gases and you know, age the air for different periods of time. And so we had two different channels, depending on whether we were filtering out the gases or just looking at particles. I won't go in, I kind of showed those sampling lines. So we had them just sitting on top and then doing the oxidation as things came out. So the question was, you know, how does the CCN, you know, change, you know, in a PAM OFR over time? Do we finally see this shift in CCN activity? You know, can that explain kappa that we see over the oceans? And how important are other VOCs? Everybody focuses, or a lot of people, I should say, a big focus has been on DMS. And I'll just tell you, we see a lot of things besides DMS coming out of the ocean, and they're coming out all the time. And so, you know, how are those driving SMA formation in the properties? Do we see them playing a role in the SMA that's forming? So this is the team, Catherine Mayer and John Sawyer, they're both graduating. Um, looking at jobs right now. So um, if you're interested, they're superstars. They ran this whole thing, as well as Alexia, Delaney, and Emily, um, who worked on, Delaney works with Tim Bertram, uh, Alexia works with me, and Emily works with Alan Goldstein. So basically, again, just to remind you, we take the gases, pump them through the PAM OFR, and then we measure sizes and composition and CCN activity. We also collected things for filter analysis. So we can vary the lamps and get different amounts of aging from a half a day all the way up to eight days. So those are the results that I will show here. So coming back to nascent sea spray, this is what's called an activation curve for how effective something forms a cloud droplet. So this is supersaturation. What you do is you can ramp that supersaturation, increase the supersaturation. And what you see is the activated fraction, those particles that actually activate and form a cloud drop. Okay. So basically what happens is no matter over the course of the bloom, all the curves take home is they're all on top of each other. Even though we knew the composition was changing in the seawater, this shows you that the, you know, directly from raw data that the CCN activity of the, of the sea spray, the primary sea spray, again, did not shift during the bloom. However, when we looked at SMA, now we started here, and then as we shifted, you know, sort of the amount of time we reacted things, now, you know, as we looked at a half day versus eight days, we could see that we started to really move um, things and move things down into this little range that we've been trying to get to for about a decade. So uh, this was a reassuring um, set of scans. We did this over the course of the bloom to see how it changed. So just to show you, this is chlorophyll concentration versus date of a bloom. These are the different aging. So just think of this as moving towards more aging. These are the voltages. And what you see is that, you know, we're basically looking at secondary marine aerosol and how that changes. And what you see is that, you know, over the, and this is shown over here, this is the amount of potential aerosol volume is SMA. So what you see is that, you know, here's the peak in phytoplankton. The SMA peaks over here. So that hints precursors are coming out after the phytoplankton bloom, and they're probably being formed by just degradation by bacteria based on the literature. So it's not a total surprise, but I have to tell you in field studies, people tend to go where the chlorophyll is highest. They don't always look over here. They're starting to, but they don't always look later. So the bacteria really play a major role in shifting the composition. So then the question becomes, if you look at this volume, aerosol volume versus date again, you know, how does that track, does it track any of the gas phase precursors? And the answer is yes. If you overlay it crudely with the DMS gas phase concentration, you can see there's a really strong correlation with them. And that the DMS seems to be, seems to be, I say seems to be driving a lot of the formation of the secondary marine aerosol, which isn't a total surprise, but this is the first time it's been shown, I think, this directly. Um, but, there's more to it than that. 
at low amounts of aging, at a half a day, you can look at sort of the correlation with BMS and it's not that good. R squared of 0.04, not that good. Only at the highest degrees of aging, eight days, do we see it becomes really strong. So DMS seems to be kicking in and becoming more and more important as the particles undergo more aging. So we can look at the SMA and get a little extra hint of what's going on. We, we used an aerosol, we had multiple, I think three aerosol mass spectrometers. Um, and so, you know, we can look at sort of the mass fraction of the different species that are present in the secondary marine aerosol that's forming. And we can look at that, this curve just shows the different extents of aging overlaid. So low aging to high aging. And what you see is at the lowest degrees of aging, we see more of an organic, a larger fraction of the secondary marine aerosol is organic. At the higher end, we see that there's much more in the way of sulfate and inorganic species and much less organics. So this hints, I don't know why this thing's on time. Um, this hints that some that different things, different gases, different gas phase precursors are driving the formation of the secondary marine aerosol at low versus high degree of aging. And I don't think this has ever been um, shown clearly before. So now if we look at how does the CCN activity change over the bloom, this is the hygroscopicity parameter. What you see is that, again, we have all the curves from low degrees of aging to high. So you see that as things age, you know, they move to having a higher hygroscopicity parameter. And, but over the course of the bloom, there's also a shift over time. So the ocean is changing and the aging is changing. And you see they sort of, there's, you know, multiple things changing here, but we can actually deconvolute um, the effects of each because luckily this is the whole reason for being in the lab. So the really nice thing, and this is just a hint at the punchline, is that kappa moves from, you know, the lowest aging to the highest aging. It moves right into that 0.7 region. And it does this for every bloom, every time. So this is starting to hint that it is these gases, it is these aging processes that are leading to the changes in marine clouds that people have been observing for several decades now. So do we, can we finally explain this sort of middle range? And the answer is yes. Um, and this is a decade of work to get to the point of actually being able to say, we have finally reproduced the real atmosphere, the real marine atmosphere in the lab. So this is a happy moment for all. Um, we're still working through the data. There's a lot of subtleties, uh, but just from a general big picture perspective, we feel really good that we're in the range of producing, we've tried to reproduce things as closely as we can to the real world. And as I say, it's taken us 10 years to get here, but I think we're pretty confident in these results. So just to summarize, and I'll go through a couple of sort of futuristic type things, you know, one thing I've come to appreciate, you know, Farouk um, has been a major player for those of you who don't know him. He's just a special person. And he was the one that discovered, as I mentioned, the microbial loop. He showed that the microbes control bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria, control the composition of the ocean. And by working with him, I've come to believe they also control the composition of the marine atmosphere. Um, we don't see that much of a change in primary sea spray um, over time. Uh, you know, much more from the aging processes, oxidation processes, they become more important. Um, you know, again, I think, why are we seeing such differences? Why do we see these VOCs? I'll tell you, we sometimes see DMDS, DMTS. These are things that oxidize way faster than DMS. So, you know, in the real world, unless you were just parked in a ship at the right spot at the right time, you would never see these species. Or you might see a glimpse, and there's like three measurements of some of these for all the field measurements in all time. Um, you know, we basically start to really see that secondary marine aerosol is playing a huge um, effect. The thing I really, we're really pushing on is this appreciation for, it's the soup. You need all the gases. You'll get a different answer if you just oxidize isoprene versus beta pinene versus DMS. When you mix them all up, you get a different answer. And so that's what we're really trying to understand better in the lab. So understanding where do these VOCs come from is a big part of what we're doing. There's multiple ways I mentioned, just biological enzymes, microbes, metabolism. You know, you can also just get heterogene heterogeneous reactions of oxidants hitting the surface of the ocean, this rich sea surface microlayer, and sun hitting. This. All of these lead to VOCs coming out. And so we're trying to understand which of these under which conditions 
because there's not going to be just one answer, but which ones are most important. So as we move forward, what are we going? You know, the ocean is changing faster than we can keep up. This is the pier. Uh, the ocean in La Jolla now has gotten warmer than it is in Hawaii at times during the summer. No one thought all the microbes are shifting. So all the gas phase emissions are shifting. And so we want to be able to start sort of looking at how these things are going to be affecting the composition of our atmosphere and our climate. And so coming on board in 2021, uh, we have, we were funded by the NSF MRI program to build a SOARS system. It will allow us to now start to add in wind speeds because note we've only looked at breaking waves so we can do wind speeds up to 19 meters per second. We can also control the temperature so we can do polar oceans. We can make sea ice. Um, Paul will light up on that. And then one thing we're really wanting to do is to integrate this with a really high-end um, smog chamber. We're working on all of our money is going towards this simulator, so we're trying to bump up the efforts on this, this smog chamber to be able to really have a fully coupled system um, that people can use. Everyone, you're invited to come use it. Um, it's going to be an amazing system. It's almost built. Uh, it's right. It's really close right now. The pandemic has slowed us down. I just want to touch on, this is work, this is slide, Gil Nathanson, who's part of the center, Tim Bertram, they look at like, taking these messy systems and actually doing reactions on them and trying to understand how the heterogeneous chemistry changes. This was the original goal of CASE. Yes, we are doing it. I am more involved in, as you say, the messy stuff, um, but these are just really cool experiments where we take observations of what is present coming out of the real ocean and then, you know, He's doing, he also doing experiments where he's making a liquid microjet of seawater, real seawater, and crossing it and looking at the reactions that occur. So it's a pretty exciting time in case right now. Um, they can actually, they've moved the theory past the resistor model that's been used forever. Um, Doug Worsnop was at our annual meeting and he said, wow, you know, you finally are moving the needle. You know, it's like we're actually pushing things to really understand what happens on these complex uh, tropospheric surfaces. The other thing we do that's beauty of a center that I, I actually really love are these faces. This is down in Mexico. Um, we, we, we're doing cloud, and there's a teacher doing the cloud in a bottle experiment. You see these kids, the, how happy they are to see this cloud form. Um, we had to put particles in there so they learn about cloud formation. We pass out these kits that teachers can take. We make um, presentations in multiple languages and we've disseminated these all over for kids to learn more about climate and atmospheric chemistry. Oh, so the last thing I wanted to say um, is I just, this, you know, I just want to point out we, the world has lost a giant. Um, in the last week. Um, so, sorry. I'm going to have to go past this slide. So we lost Mario Molina. He was a huge reason for case. He's a huge reason for my success. Um, it was a shocking loss. This is him at a, a function that we, I organized at Scripps. And with his whole bunch of his people came back. The thing about him was he always said, this was for them. This was to celebrate the people that worked with him for his 70th, for, at his 70th birthday. So I'm really glad that, um, that, we, that we got to do this. Um, yeah, so a huge loss. Uh, Mother, I always say Mother Earth has shed a few tears as well because he was just a huge advocate. He taught me, he's, you know, I can blame him to some extent. And I did blame him for getting so heavily involved in pushing um, for the policies um, related to SARS-CoV-2 because it's just not enough as scientists to, I think, to just stop at the science. You can make, you can make a difference and help implement policies and, and push people. And so I, part of my persistence has been after you know knowing that we can make a difference getting the real science in there it is motivated by my interactions with him he was just he was my biggest one of my biggest if not my biggest supporter um and yeah he's going to be greatly missed so uh, back to um you know sort of we if you're interested in graduate studies or postdoc or sending undergrads you know it's a huge amount going on right now it's interdisciplinary research you know, this is, this is the pier. This is Sally Ride. Um, you know, you can do, it's just, it's an amazing time. I, you know, I'm very proud that we're able to train students and postdocs across multiple disciplines. The heart of what we do is chemistry for sure, but 
we're working with people in every area across campus. I could even add sort of social sciences and arts here too, because part of relaying what we do, we tap into those as well. And so with that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Kim. Uh, so full disclosure for everyone, I, I may have broken Kim's heart when I said, please don't talk about COVID. Give us an escape away from COVID to take us on a scientific adventure in the realm of ocean atmosphere interactions. And, and man, did you, <laughs> did you deliver on that? Thank you so much. You. I have a ton of questions, but of course, students come first. So I'll in, invite uh, everyone to, uh, if you raise your hand, I will uh, manage the, the questions and, and urge students to, to go, to go first, don't be shy. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll start with uh, Marat. Thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I have just, uh, I'm atmospheric scientist, duh. and so do you have direct evidence uh, from satellite uh, that these blooms actually causing change in cloud radiative forcing, especially low level clouds, because I presume them would be mostly affected. Thanks. Yeah, so that's, that's an area that we're just, we're just getting into. I think we've inspired other people. Um, to look look at this question it's a hard it actually turns out to be a hard one to address you probably know i mean i'm sort of one of the problems is when you're trying to understand what the ocean is doing and clouds are blocking you it's hard to sort of you know tease this out right and so you know i know there's a couple papers um that have come out on the southern ocean sort of showing that these changes can be you know correlated with the cloud properties um their work done with Susanna boroughs and people in Israel. There's been a few papers and I think with all the studies and I, I, you know, I, I'm ex I think there's many more that are coming because there's been so many studies on the Southern Ocean, massive studies. So what I hope CASE does, you know, is that we try to just sort of do it in a controlled way and say, and provide information to other people to go look. Although I do have a couple of students that are starting to get trained in satellites, but you know, the goal is to like say, don't look here, look here, you know, and you should see a change. It's not so easy sometimes to do, but we're just, that's, that's a super important thing to look for, um, you know, to test, to see whether, you know, but I, I would be surprised if it, if it, if you don't see the changes. And I think, as I say, there's hints that you do. There are a couple of papers over the last uh, three to five years that I've seen coming out on this, but I expect there to be even more. Students, anyone? Oh, if you don't, you know what will happen. I'll, I'll start asking questions. Okay, <laughs> Daniel, I knew you'd, you would. Hi, Kim. Oh, great talk, great overview, very nice work. I'm, I'm still in shock about uh, Mario's loss. I didn't know the last week I spent night shifting at the Stixum mm. uh, and I'm just catching up with my health and with news and emails. So I'm still uh, quite floored on that news. So uh, yeah, we are. It's a major, major loss. Yeah. Um, um, well, so I mean, I really appreciate it uh, about the reactive gases, VOCs. And that reminds me, I think. There was a paper of Meskitze or Nenes, a science paper over 10 years ago. Where yeah, oh, yeah. Question. They had to retract it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And isop isoprene comes out like crazy, right? Yes. It and does. So most of us ran to the primary particles. Yeah. And I was very no. critical about this paper, You're, too. And, yep. Uh, yep. And now it comes a bit back. And that's great to see. And it makes it more complex. And my question to that is, I mean, you showed nicely how you oxidize more of the VOCs, it becomes the hygroscopicity increases with aging, and you compared or it's big quest with the field measurement hygroscopicity. And I was wondering now, thinking about all the SOA community, and I'm a bit part of that, and hygroscopicity with particle aging, O to C ratios, all this, you know, very well. Yeah. Yeah. If you compare to the field measurements, maybe we have to be very careful to determine the age of that air mass too. Or so if you measure the 
hygroscopicity of, of particles in the, in the field, I would assume these were not nascent or sea spray generated. No, they're probably the secondary. There's yeah, exactly. hardly any. <laughs> yes, and so one would have to sample without a bubbler and then also doing some backward trajectory to know how old they are. So mm -hmm. if you compare the hygroscopicity of 0.6, then that would mean, all right, so how much age, you know, one day old maybe. Right. A day old and that fits then but if they come or uh, we're already aloft for a week then maybe you would expect a little bit higher hygroscopicity mm -hmm, so maybe mm -hmm. that's just some question to your comparison that's maybe something we have to do yeah i think i think that can be done differently now um and as i say i just i can't believe it tim bertram all these guys tease me because i'm like now and jose doug they all give me a bad time right because I was the one that said SOA, it's just overrated, right? But it's like, there it is, and mm -hmm. we showed it, right? And so, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things to be done, but I just think, and you know, John Abbott has shown this um, up in the Arctic as well. You know, he was started getting hints right around the time we realized this was happening and started saying, hmm, primary doesn't seem that important, right? And so <laughs> it's like, it's a wake up call for all of us. I didn't show this, I almost put it in, but it, I would have had time. Um, we can talk about it later, but I, we also did it, Paul DeMont did the effective aging, oxidative aging on the ice nucleation activity. And it oh, has, yeah, and that was, it drives me out. comment on that. I mean, we, we showed that the SOA can be ice nucleating particles. Yeah. And we were yeah. very grilled from the community because everyone think it's dust, dust, dust. But yeah. of course, these oxidized products can be solid at low temperature. Yeah. Yep, they are more present, and then it has ice nucleic Very nice. Absolutely. It's very exciting. So I stopped now to give other people time okay. because I would chat with you now the next two hours. <laughs> Maybe next time when we All meet. Right. All right. Yeah, great. great. All right. Thank you. Okay, Steve, you're up. Yeah. Hi. Hi again, Kim. Nice, very nice talk. Very, very nice overview. I, I echo Daniel's comments there. Um, about eight or ten slides from the end, you had a stacked time series showing the increase of sulfate as, as a function of time. Um, I don't know if you can go back to it, but yeah, you look like you, looks like you are. This one? Or no, uh, no, this keep one going back. There you go. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, the, you've got the, the inorganics, uh, the sulfate, the ammonium, the nitrate. Um, I guess what might or might not be the elephant in the room is, well, what about sodium and chloride? And uh, aren't, are, are we forgetting salt and its role? Or um, maybe you, that's what I'd like you to elaborate on. Yeah, it's just, yeah, that's a great question. It, let me just tell you, when you make this, when you turn on this uh, camo afar, you know, you just overwhelm the system in these particles. You know, there's just, there's hardly any primary sea spray, relatively speaking. And this, remember this is an AMS measurement, which is not sensitive to those. I mean, they can make it sensitive kind of by bumping up their filament temperatures or whatever. They can play tricks to see the salts and they did that. But this is A, it's submicron and B, it is just gobs and gobs, I don't know what else to say it, thousands and thousands of the secondary marine aerosol, which just the primary, marine aerosol or primary sea spray is probably one thousandth, one one thousandth, one ten thousand. So it's just lost. It's just overwhelmed by these. It would be there, but the, and I think this is true for the real world, Steve, in that we also have looked for, we've done these blooms, and I didn't talk about this, but I thought of you. Um, we've tried to get the dang flux to change over the course of a bloom, right? So we've just looked at, can we see an increase in primary sea spray as the bloom progresses, because you change, you know, that film on the top, right? You could, you should. The most we've ever been able to get, ever, from just primary change in flux of primary sea spray is about thirty percent. So, so what size range are we are, are we looking at here? This is submicron mostly. Okay, and so what you're what what I'm hearing you say is that uh, because of all this chemistry that's going on. The any primary uh, uh, sea salt, sea spray aerosol is being overwhelmed by in in, in the submicron region by yes. all of this uh, secondary uh, particle uh, uh, particulate matter formation. 
That's correct. And I think that's what happens in the real world too. Is that fair? Yes. And I think that's what happens in the real world too, based on John. So that's, that's, so that's, that's really important to recognize. And I'm not sure that I did. And, and uh, Ernie may want to jump in and say, no, 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 we knew all this, this all the time, but um, I'm really struck by what you, what you've just indicated. Yeah, it's overwhelming, and we see it over and over. I just got a message that my internet internet is unstable, so you might not have heard all of what I said, but I think you got the gist of it. We did. I did. I got it. Thank you. All right, Kim, let me jump in. Um, <laughs> I'll start. I have three questions at least. Only three. Ooh. Well, we'll get started. Anyway, um, so, yeah, the SMA production you know, photochemical processing of the gases, it's fascinating. If you look at the vertical profile of ozone above the ocean surface, you see that ozone is depleted in the near surface atmosphere. And if you believe models, it implies that there's halogen photochemistry occurring in that near surface air. With those alkenes that you're showing there, you know, if you're making bromine atoms, they'll add across a double bond. And so you're, you know, the, some of the mass spec data ought to show isotopic signals of whether there is any halogen chemistry involved in the oxidation. So what do you say? I say you're right. Um, and I, we remember that this, so we're, what, what we'd like to do, and we're going to do this with Bill Broom, is um, there, you know, so this panel of R is just, it's just only looking at OH. So, right, it's just OH reactions. Um, but they're changing this panel of R so you can spike it with chlorine and bromine. You can make those in the panel of R. That's what we want to do. And so, you know, you're absolutely right. It should be there. We should be able to see it once we start react. Because I kind of have gone a little bit, I got a little grumpy sometimes about, we're focused so much on OH. What about, I think of you, right? And also, Paul Crutzen and other people have said to me, what about the, you know, what about the halogens? That's the driver, especially cl even chlorine, right? I know you love bromine, but chlorine, right? Well, there's also I mean, iodine. If you talk I, yeah. to, uh, what's her name, uh, in the UK. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's Lucy. She's one of our, she's one of our advisors. So she's jumping out of her seat every yep. time we talk about this. So I, this is wide open. And the answer is you're right, but I, we haven't gone there yet, but we need to. And we will. Okay, Steve, is your hand a legacy hand? <laughs> sorry, sorry I, I don't know enough to lower my hand. <laughs> I think there was at least a student, one of the students that had a question. I, I don't see a hand up, but. I saw a chat. I think it was in the chat. Oh. Was it in the chat? Let me look. I had the chat and then I lost. No, no, that was. I oh, yes. Yeah, I can read it. Aventara, yes. Read it. Uh, she, was, she was wondering if the different types of organisms cause differences in the hydroscopicity parameter. That's a great question. And that's, yeah, because the different types that we think, right, we haven't connected it. We have all of the, we did all of the metabolomics, the genomics of this, these blooms. So we have it. So we're trying to tease that out right now. Um, but the idea is, yeah, we do know that different organisms produce different gases, different combinations of organisms produce different gases. So we expect, you know, that the species, that it'll be very species dependent, which gases are coming out. Mm -hmm. And then that affects the oxidation reactions and that affects the secondary marine aerosol. So yeah, there's definitely a connection. Um, you know, we, sometimes we get, we fall into this crazy world. We take whatever water we get out of the ocean, but we can spike it. So we're doing some experiments now where we're spiking with different critters and growing those. Um, because you can get, there's so many DMS producers, but there's these other ones that just like produce, I didn't really show it, but at the beginning of this bloom, it was all monoterpenes and isoprene that were coming out. There was no DMS. The DMS didn't come till later. So yeah, definitely the species, simple answer, species play a role. We just don't, we haven't teased all that out yet. More students? Now, uh, let, let me ask another one. Zachary, uh, was Zachary going to go? I'm going to have to say goodbye, but thank you. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Great. Thank you. It was nice to get <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Does Zachary want to go? Yeah, I was, uh, I've been investigating the claw hypothesis for about a year now in the Eastern North Atlantic. And I was really piqued when you said that you were going to bring the wind speed into the, into the, into the lab. And I was curious if you, if anybody in your group is going to investigate like a cap on the wind speed. So I've only found a relationship between DMS flux and wind speed, but I know there's a lot of papers out there that say that there's a certain cap that the wind speed hits where that relationship disappears. So I was curious if you're going to investigate that at all. Yeah, we're going to look, one of the things we're going to look, yeah, absolutely, we'll do it as a function of wind speed for all the VOCs. But what's really, the, that's just, I mean, that's just going to open up a can of worms of the ratio of VOCs, if you think about it, right? Because it's the solubility driven, right? So all of that, when you start blowing wind over that surface, we're going to launch massive, even more VOCs. This was all done with just simple one breaking wave. But once we start going, then we'll be able to ramp, we can control the wind speed and look at just what you're saying for all of for all of them not just bms but like i i, I expect we try we're trying to do it on our little scale we have like a fan because i'm i'm so chomping at the bit to see what happens to those vocs when we start putting wind on there it's going to be really cool yeah that's a great thank question thank you Sorry. thanks more student questions i don't know how kim saw that and i didn't Kim, let me ask another one. I, I'm curious about all this ga interesting molecules in the gas phase. Um, are they all coming uh, out of the bubble bursting directly or, or do you think there's things like um, clipping of fragments off of large biological molecules, exudates and so on that then go into the gas phase, get oxidized and go back? How much interaction do you think there is like that between organics and the particles into the gas phase and back? Yeah, um, you know, the way we're looking at it, we're not able to, the way we're doing it right now, it would be hard for us to tease out, we get the net, right, whatever the net is, um, and the net, what's coming out mostly, because that's what we're sucking out, right? But your question is, is well taken. You're thinking of like, so I think, I think that one of like, People are finding all, you know, acetaldehyde and formaldehyde in marine environments, massive amounts. They can't explain where they come, it comes from, right? I think that's what you're getting at. Um, that could be, there's many ways, reasons. It's clipping to the microbes. So the, you know, the microbes chewing up, nipping things off, they do that really well. There's also just sunlight hitting the surface of the ocean. That's a massive surface if you think about it. So that could also clip off little pieces. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to go like sort of separate those into different steps. And as you say, even the particles themselves, right? That's what you're getting at. Is like if they have a this, yeah. what, what I found is that I, I kind of, my gut feeling, and I, I'm gonna say it, I could be wrong, but it's a hypothesis is, and so it's okay. Um, that's how science is done, right? But basically, you know, we have this vision of, of that being really important because of the model system that's been used, which has been SALT in SDS, right? shows this beautiful ordered, you know, tails sticking out. So it looks like it should happen. And I think it probably does happen with that kind of system. But it, I don't think it's as likely. Things are much more dissolved and much, you saw more islandy. Once you get the real system, you don't see this well-ordered available surface. We don't shut off the react, to calibrate you, you know, when you do the model system, you know, we went to all this work, do we get the same answer? Could we have just used salt and SDS? The answer is no. We cannot, we do not see any reduction in heterogeneous reactivity with the real system. And that's because it's got these islands and patchy parts and so the gases can go right on through. And so I don't think that that's gonna be as large as the source. The surface of the ocean I think could be, it's a much larger, you can do the calculation, there's a heck of a lot more surface area available from that, but we're just starting to look at that. This is, that's work that Vicki Grassian is, is leading, um, the photochemistry side of things, and she, we're just, that's just a big focus for us right now. Okay, Steve. Yeah, um, in our business, of course, we never have the last word, but what's the present state word with respect to your work and, and the CLAW hypothesis? Um, I think, I think that the claw hypothesis is, you know, is 
can can be part of the explanation, but it's not all of the explanation. I think that the focus people just I don't want to, how do I say this? We have a paper out that sort of says, it doesn't say DMS is overrated, because it's not, sometimes it's dominant. But sometimes it's not there and there's a lot of other gases that are driving it. So I think the claw hypothesis is the beginning and DMS, can, and it can certainly explain the cloud brightness if you look at the right time, I believe that. But I think there's just a whole host of gases. We find methane thiol, we find dimethyl disulfide, as I mentioned. These things are so, they react like rockets, way faster. So DMS, but I would argue, the reason people focus on DMS, I think, is that it's what's left. If you did, aren't sitting in the right place at the right time, there's just so much of it, and it's not as reactive as the other gases. And so it's kind of like the smoking gun of what the last little puff is left. But if it's there, there were, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There were a whole bunch of other gases that were there before that. That have already reacted away and gone on and affected your class. Well, let, let me rephrase the question. Sure. Um, make a broader claw hypothesis, a, a greater claw yeah. hypothesis yeah. that says that um, yeah. uh, marine phytoplankton activity, marine biology more broadly, yeah. uh, is, is playing a, a, a key influence on the CCN environment um, in, in, the, in the marine atmosphere. Could, could you perhaps address that as, as the broader claw hypothesis? I think the broader claw hypothesis is very likely, is what I will say. I, I, I just really think it's playing a huge role in the brightness of the clouds. I so, just, and, 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 and as, as Charleston and, and, and was Charleston Lovelock, Andre, and Warren, to give them the credit, mm -hmm. uh, hypothesized that, that there would be a feedback loop involving uh, 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 solar irradiance at, at the surface and, and, and as absorbed by the planet and uh, marine uh, biology. And I think, I mean, that was a very attractive hypothesis. And, and, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that sort of broader claw hypothesis in, in, uh, in, in, in terms of the, the effects of, of clouds on the marine environment as influenced by the, the marine biology. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. We can't, we can't, like right now, all we're doing is looking at the one way, right? We're looking at what comes out, how it changes the clouds. We're not looking at the feedback, but you could, right? And as I say, if we show that you get more CCN active, you know, brighter clouds, that is gonna change. So what we're trying to do now is we're gonna start changing the flux that hits the surface in answer to your question and start to see if we can change how that changes the microbial population. The other thing is in the claw hypothesis, if, as I recall, they focus, they have a very strong focus on phytoplankton doing everything. It's not the phytoplankton. It, I mean, they're, they're food, they're important, but it's, they drive the bacteria, right? And so there's, I would broaden it there too, in terms of the biology. But in answer to your question, I can't comment on yet on the feedback, but I can say that the microbes can certainly control the cloud brightness and cool things off if they want to. And I, I'm kind of a believer in microbes right now. I kind of am a believer that they are very effective and they're trying their hardest to control those clouds. And then humans are coming along and slicing it out, right? And that's what we're trying to understand now. That's what SOARS is about, is that we've now got, you'll love this, I think, and that we have the ocean before humans, and now we can start throwing in the, you know, concentrations of pollutants from humans and see how that changes the cloud properties. So we can start to add on, we know pre-humans and now we can start adding in humans and that's our focus for the next 10 years. Well, you're saying they're trying like mad and that implies a kind of an altruism that is, a, I think, a much greater cost to the organism than it's other survival benefits. So I, I, I would say it's, it may be a, a, a side benefit, but they, that can't be the objective of, of these organisms. Yeah, they've got some reason, you know, and as I say, they get wiped out when things get too hot. I'll tell you that. We see these huge shifts and certain other ones take over. So we could talk about this all day. I, I can't think like a microbe. I try. If you talk to Fruit Kazam, he will talk to you like a microbe. He does think like a microbe. They have, they're smart. They've been evolving for a long, long time. Somebody said like billions of years. So they, I do believe they have a method to their madness. I can't quite get in their brains, but I do think they're smart. They're really smart.
or they've adapted anyway. So anyway, so on can, that note. Can I push this a, a little bit further? The claw yep. hypothesis was com pretty much completely focused on DMS and right. sulfate. Yep. So is it fair to say maybe as a hypothesis that it's other things, uh, you know, oxidation products that are driving up kappa? Yes. Besides sulfate. Yes. Sometimes it's not sulfate. Sometimes it's there's very little sulfate in those particles. And for some reason, there's still, you know, the, it's interesting to watch how this mixture, the hygroscopicity, isn't necessarily what you would predict, thinking it's mostly organic -y. It sort of looks salty. And there's crazy things that go on when you get the real mixtures. And we're trying to tease that out still. Yep, but that's, that's I, would agree, I would agree with that. That it's not always DMS. I mean, DMDS, DMDS oxidizes 10 times faster and forms twice as many sulfates too. So we can't forget those things are coming out all the time too. And we see those more in coastal environments and more in estuaries. So there is some really interesting, we're, right, we're right, working on a proposal right now to look at this edge of the urban plus coastal. Because people don't think of the ocean, believe it or not, as a source of these important, we see reduced nitrogen coming out of the ocean, all the time these things are coming out. They're going to react and change urban air quality. We don't, we don't hear about that very much. It's not in the inventories of most models. So we're trying to fix that. There's one value, a fixed value, and that's unbelievable to me. There's a lot of work to be done for a lot, for a lot of people's careers. I, long after I'm done, I just hope that we entice people to want to look at it. And people can come do measurements anytime. You're welcome to come do measurements anytime. It's a nice it's so much easier to learn things. It's still hard, but it's a lot easier than a field study. I'll say that. I, yeah, I shouldn't say a lot easier. It can be really hard because <laughs> the microbes don't always cooperate. Uh, did I see a hand go up and then it disappeared? A any other questions? There's Nick. Nick went up and then it went down. <laughs> well, I... So I raised my hand. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I raised my hand. Uh, you see me? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, like um, the the first question that Steve uh, mentioned, the, the slides, aging of the um, sea, uh, like marine aerosols, second yeah. marine aerosols, the colorful, uh, colorful one, mm -hmm. like um, maybe a we see that slides. Can we go back? Uh, uh, secondary marine, the aging of secondary marine uh, aerosol. You want to get back to the AMS plot? Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, never thought I'd show AMS data in uh, life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Daniel's got to be laughing. <laughs> I've sold my soul. Okay, it's it's this one. Yeah. So uh, my question is like I kind of understand like uh, the aging of organic components like maybe due to the fragmentation of that's OH, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, that's why it decreases. But I so for the inorganics, uh, is this increase like a relative mass ratio or yeah, it's uh, it's mass? Look on the left, it's micrograms per cubic meters. So what it comes down to, we're right. We've got this paper submitted. Um, and I'll just give you the punchline because you're asking the right questions, is that mm -hmm. it's really interesting when you, we actually had to look at this. When you crank up, you know how you can do fragmentation versus oxidation for organics, right? I'm really mm -hmm. I'm starting to speak that AMS lingo. But when you yeah. do that, um, so it turns out isoprene, when you jack it up, this is, this is driven, this part here is driven by isoprene during this bloom. And when you jack up the oxidation time, you fragment the isoprene, so the organics become less, right? But over here, it turns out that DMS doesn't do that. DMS mm -hmm. doesn't fragment. It forms more sulfate. So that's what happens, is that if you plot DMS and sort of what happens to it as you increase, as you change the aging, it just goes up and stays high. It doesn't fragment. It's really interesting. It behaves completely differently than these pure organic compounds. And I don't think anybody's ever shown that before, but it's, it's in our paper. It'll be out hopefully soon. So it's a, it's like the absolute increase of the mass. Mm -hmm. Yes. So okay. Okay. Increase okay. And relative, you can see that the green on the right at the highest yeah. of aging becomes really small compared to all the inorganics. Versus on the other end, it's like nearly half 
half as much of it, maybe 40%, right? And so it just has to do with what you do to that organic precursor. If you fragment it down, you know, then you're, you know, you're not going to see as much of it being driven into, um, you just make tinier organics that don't end up as SMA. That makes sense. Okay, that, that makes sense, yeah. So uh, I have a, like a second question for the speaker is when you do this uh, like OH, OH exposure experiment, uh, yeah. what's like the relative humidity, like the phase state of those aerosol particles? Yeah, that's a I good think, question. We have bounce. Yeah. I will tell you, they bounce like crazy. This is Nate Slade. So yeah, that light up, but he's got he's got a gold mine. Get him getting those papers out, Daniel. <laughs> he is sitting on a gold mine. He has bounce like you wouldn't believe. So I can't remember how he conditions his RH at different ones, I think, before he makes his measurements, but he had a LP and could look at bounce. He has lots of bounce going on. He has some very cool results. And so um, he, he changed the RH to look at what you're saying. Um, and he compared the bounce of primary versus secondary. And I can tell you, these things bounce like marbles. So that gets back to your point. So he's sitting on, a, as a, he, Nate's got these measurements. So Nate Slade. Okay, okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, so uh, I understand, like, for, uh, like, if it's solid or a, a glassy state, like, um, the fragmentation effect will be, like, more significant. That's so true. I, I also that's assume, true. like, it's a, like, a, it's bound. I see. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank yeah, you. That's a, yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. That's, that's yeah. correct. Yep. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh -huh. Staying with the slide for the moment, is the implication of the decrease of the organics that that organic matter is going from the particle phase into the gas phase? Yeah, that it's ending up more in the, you're ending up with the, back to Paul's question, you end up with a lot of the little tiny um, acetaldehyde and the fragments of the organics. You're absolutely right. The carbon ends up in tiny stuff that can't condense in the particles. That's exactly right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions, or have we tired our our? I gotta take a nap. It's early for me still. I might just go take a nap. No, I gotta go to the next the next meeting, the next Zoom meeting, Zoom the life of Zoom. But I'm glad these are great questions. This is this is awesome. Well, I, let's let's give our speaker uh, some rest before the next Zoom. I I just want to comment that Kim invited us to. Send people out there, send good people out there to do experiments. Kim uh, sent to me one of the best people who ever set foot in my lab. And uh, we, we SOMA, sent uh, Nate Slade, as she's mentioned, to UCSD, but I'm not sure about the balance of payments here. <laughs> so I, I do want, want to encourage people to to participate in the great things going out there at, at UCSD, send send Kim great postdocs and and uh, let's keep it, the relationship going. Yep. This was a fantastic uh, talk. I, I really enjoyed it. You got lots of questions, and uh, we know that you, you know there's a lot of demand on your time. So thanks very much, Kim. Yeah. No. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to know I can still talk about. Um, basic science <laughs> instead of this virus. <laughs> so this was fun. It was a it was a it was a break for me. So thank you. Yep. Back to back to changing CDC language on Monday. <laughs> anyway, I, when Fauci talks about the crazy aerosol person, that's me. So yeah, yeah, I've driven Fauci to the point of leaving in aerosols. No <laughs> Fauci to stay tough. He he poor guy. Anyway, yeah. He's he's we're getting there. There's a little bit of a shift going on right now. So we'll see. But everybody stay safe. Wear masks. They work. I had to say that. So um, anyway, right. thanks, everybody. It thanks was great. for coming to Long Island. And maybe someday I'll come visit you when we can again. That'd be great. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>